Hello, and thank you for joining us on the webinar today. Happy EMS week to everyone. On this occasion of Save a Life Day, Stop the Bleed, we are so excited to bring you this webinar, Short Transports and Life-Saving Interventions, the New Orleans EMS Blood Medics. I am Hillary Gates, Director of Educational Strategy at Prodigy EMS. We'd like to thank 410 Medical, maker of the LifeFlow blood and fluid infuser for supporting the free CE you'll be receiving for this webinar. At the conclusion of the broadcast, we'll post a QR code that will take you to Prodigy EMS where you can claim your CE credit. So we all know that in EMS, we have mostly focused on rapid transport and load and go for critically ill trauma patients, but New Orleans EMS thinks differently. After years of watching exsanguinating trauma patients die in front of them, they've changed the paradigm. In fact, in the first few months of administering blood products to trauma patients, they have already seen a vast improvement in patient outcomes. Today, you'll learn how they did it and how this program has not only improved survival, but has also boosted morale in the ranks and demonstrating the true difference that EMS professionals can make in the field. I'd like to welcome our three speakers. Dr. Emily Nichols is the Deputy Medical Director of New Orleans EMS. Captain Tom Dransfield is a paramedic and quality assurance and safety officer at New Orleans EMS. And Dr. Mark Peel is the Associate Medical Director for WakeMed Mobile Critical Care and the Founder and Chief Medical Officer of 410 Medical. Take it away, guys. Thank you so much, Hillary, and thank you, Prodigy EMS, for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, as stated, I'm Dr. Emily Nichols. I am one of three medical directors here at New Orleans EMS, and I'm really excited to be presenting beside Captain Tom Dransfield and Dr. Peel, who we have been fortunate enough to get to know since initiating our blood product program. We're really here to take the next few moments just to tell you about our innovative experience with pre-hospital blood administration. And this actually began over three years ago. I'm hoping by the conclusion that you will be encouraged to review opportunities within your own agency. And it truly is an honor to talk about this during EMS Week 2022. I want to personally recognize the men and women at New Orleans EMS because they have risen to the challenge each and every day. Blood is just one example of the great work that they've done. Now, when asked why we decided to start this program, you can see somber statistics of the city of New Orleans right here. We unfortunately have one of the highest per capita murder rates in the United States. And like many other cities, we saw an unprecedented murder spike during the pandemic. You can just Google New Orleans gun violence and you will actually see pictures of our providers at New Orleans EMS. But it's deeper than that for us. Our first responders often live, work, and build their families and their homes in the city of New Orleans. Many of our providers were actually raised here. And we realized that we have been watching our loved ones die on the streets and we grew weary. And so our colleagues in the hospital setting were feeling the same weary spirit. Back in 2019, Dr. Juan Duchesne, who is a trauma surgeon at the University Medical Center sent me this slide from a lecture that he had actually given to his colleagues. UMC is the only ACS verified level one trauma center in New Orleans. And this graph here actually shows their trends in trauma deaths since 2008, right before they initiated their massive transfusion protocol program in, two, in 2009. So over the last 13 years, they've had numerous advances in trauma resuscitation, as you can see in the little squares at the top. And they've actually decreased the number of OR deaths as de depicted in the bars in red. Even in 2013, when they started using tourniquets, New Orleans EMS quickly took the initiative and we started doing the same in the pre-hospital setting. And so back in 2019, Dr. Duchesne asked us to, to do the same with whole blood. They noticed that they were seeing a decrease in OR deaths, but yet they still saw the rise in the ER and they really wanted to address that from getting patients blood earlier and in, in the pre-hospital setting. So from this, we started looking at our data and really started thinking about how we define these first critical moments after a patient's injury. And so we always talk about the golden hour, but we don't always remember exactly where it started. Back in 1975, the founder of modern trauma surgery 
chose this point in time as an arbitrary moment based on the number of deaths that he was seeing while caring for his patients at shock trauma in Maryland. And what they found, as you can see in the graph below, is that the majority of deaths were happening within the first 30 minutes of hospital arrival. This is how they hypothesized that getting patients to the hospital to definitive care quickly would actually save more lives. Now that was definitely not wrong, but remember that this statement actually was, came from in 1975. This is back when modern EMS was just developing. This was back when we were still scooping and running. And so since then, we've evolved. We've become more than ambulance drivers over the last 50 years. It is very clear that we are pre-hospital providers bringing care directly to patients on scene. And we now know that faster care does not always equal better care. It's really about getting patients the critical interventions that they need safely and as soon as possible, whether that's in the hospital or the pre-hospital setting. And so we do this already. We do it with airway management. We do it with chest compressions and CPR. And we also do it in trauma with tourniquets. And so when we started our journey, we wanted to see if we could address mortality by giving blood products in the field. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Captain Dransfield to tell you exactly how we got started. As Dr. Nichols was saying, we, we started looking at this back in 2019 and we started talking to uh, Dr. Duchesne and he's just a big advocate and he's the one that kept basically bringing it up every time we'd say like, yeah, 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 it's not gonna be feasible for us. He was the one battling that against all the surgeons and everybody else. So he's a big advocate for us and, and you know, a pioneer in his research. And he wanted to, to basically, he pushed us and he helped us along the way and got us going. So we started talking with him and figured out what we needed to do because we had no concept. We knew some places around the country were doing it. Um, so then we started talking there in house to University's Blood Bank. And we went in discussions with them. And that was a long drawn out process because they didn't know we didn't know. And so uh, during that time, I also reached out to the uh, trauma coordinators there at university. And I uh, wanted to see just to judge because we didn't track how much people, how much blood people got after we dropped them off. So I asked him, I said, for 2018, can you give me the number of patients that we brought in from EMS that received blood within like four hours? And so they gave me a number of like, I think it was 88 is what it was. And so we estimate 80 to 100 a year based on 2018 numbers. And uh, so uh, then we had to look on the other aspect is like the Louisiana Bureau of EMS, the scope of practice to make sure that we as paramedics were able to administer that blood. Uh, we can monitor blood, but administering was another uh, whole nother process and whole nother hurdle to get through. But luckily, a couple of months before they had seen the light, I guess, I don't know, it was divine intervention or whatever, but they had approved that already ahead of time. So um, that that was two big things checked off our list. You know, we had the, the, the numbers and then we had the uh, scope of practice down. And then so we started our planning session. This was in September of 2019. And, and what I did is I reached out to the heavy hitters that I knew of in the industry that were doing it. Uh, it was San Antonio Fire. I talked to uh, Lieutenant Bullock, William Bullock over there. And uh, they carried the low tide or whole blood is what they were carrying. Uh, he was just a wealth of information along was uh, Eric Bank over at Harris County, ESD number 48, uh, also in Texas, and Cypress Creek EMS, uh, Ren Neely. They were all carrying blood, um, whole blood, and they had, had morphed from doing it just in trauma to into medical. We were going to focus on trauma, we thought. And there's one other person I reached out to, and it was Loudoun County, Virginia. And I found out that their blood program is just for MCIs only at the time. I think since now they've, they've updated that and, and moved on. But um, it was just an interesting, another concept, just like another way we could have gone with it. But um, so we started looking at what we had to look at based on everything that I got from those guys, which was like drinking from a fire hose um, and wade through it. <laughs> and then we had to look at, OK, logistically, what is it going to take to put it in our in our hands and in, in the hands of our blood medics, right? Our paramedics that could do this and, and administer the blood. So we needed to know what product we were gonna get. We needed to know how we were gonna keep it cool. We needed to know how we were gonna infuse it. Because um, most of the, everybody else that I talked to is using some kind of commercial like pump warmer device. Of course, being a, a municipal municipality in a city, um, you know, it's, and this was not a proven concept. This was a, a trial is what we were gonna do. So we wanted to do it on 
that was my goal or my task, I guess, task from above is do it as cheap as you can because we don't want to spend any money until we can prove that we can do this, right? So we needed a place to store the blood. We needed, uh, you know, just what we needed to do in the, as far as the process. So we worked with Dr. Duchesne and Dr. Nichols, and we, we kind of looked at what, what we needed to do and also worked with our logistics staff to say like, hey, what do we have? What can we get? And then, so we're just rocking along, doing good. Like, you remember, this is September of 2019. In October of 2019, we had a, a catastrophic event, event happen here in the city. We had uh, one of the hotels under construction, Hard Rock Hotel collapsed. And that was a major, major event for us that basically it halted all of our progress on any outside projects because we became in, involved in that project uh, or that incident. And it, it lasted for uh, quite a long time because there were some people accessible in their victims that we couldn't get to. And so it became a long drawn out event. So we were kind of trying to stabilize from that. And then in 2019, uh, the end of it in December, we suffered a, a cyber attack on the city, which basically everything that we'd been working on was taken away from us by the IT people. They locked everything down. We lost all our computers. If it didn't have a hard copy of it, we didn't have it anymore. So that was another setback. Okay, so then what do we do? We roll into January of 2020, New Year's Eve, which is always a big thing here. With that comes the Sugar Bowl, which is always here. And then we had the college football championship right on top of that. And then what's the next month? We had Mardi Gras, right? No problem. We handle it. We do this every day, right? Or we did. And then what happened? Boom, COVID. COVID hits, right? Well, in between Mardi Gras and that, so we, we kind of picked back up in March, right? After Mardi Gras, we started talking about blood products again. And then we found out that the blood uh, bank at the hospital was unable to fulfill our needs. Uh, and so then we went to a uh, local, we found a local distributor of the blood bank here in town uh, was able to do it. So um, we were able to get with them and uh, work out a, a very good partnership with them. And that's what everybody had told me on the people I consulted is like, that's going to make or break you as your blood supplier. And that's the one of the big lessons that we learned is that good working relationship with them, have it local. Some of the ones in Texas were getting theirs out of Florida from a blood bank that had to be FedExed in. We're fortunate enough to when we have a use of it, we can call the guy, say, oh, you call me 24-7. I'll have you blood within four hours. And to this day, they've done that every time we've called them. We were going to go with whole blood. We thought we liked the idea of that. And then there was uh, the, the shortages we found. And it was the cost was so expensive on it, more compared to what we ended up going with was the LRBCs. And so we... Um, we talked with the blood bank and they said, you know, we are able to do a one for one swap back with you on the, the LRBCs. Like if you don't use it and it stays in temp and stays good, we'll pull it back and then they'll redistribute it to someone uh, else down the line. But the whole blood, once we have it in our possession, it was ours. So it was not a cost, of, you know, feasibility for us that we didn't like that because it was like we didn't know. We still at this point didn't know we were going to be using it, right? And then, um, so we rocked along. We had COVID hit us hard right in March, right? And so we had some pretty, pretty down days here because we got, we were one of the epicenters of COVID. So we focused all of our efforts on that. I didn't even talk about blood, think about blood. You know, uh, my office, we've worked exclusively on COVID protocols, updating that throughout the other, uh, you know, partners in the city that we have, uh, police, fire. And, um, Dr. Nichols uh, and, and uh, Dr. Marino were very instrumental in leading the charge around the, the nation and even the world in some aspects because they were, everybody was looking at us like, what did New Orleans do? Because nobody wanted to make a decision. So we rocked, rocked along, got through COVID and we got to the first stopping point in September. And we said like, we're gonna kind of get back up on this because we needed to focus on something else. So uh, during that time, we decided, we chose we wanted to go with the blood bank. We chose what we wanted to do. And so we uh, we started the process of getting it a contract established with the city and the blood center of Louisiana. That took us about six or eight months. Anybody that knows dealing with municipal government, um, it's a process. And it was even delayed even more due to COVID because we had remote workers, right? So everybody at City Hall that we could normally go like, hey, can you just handle this and walk it through? It was like, oh, well, I come in one day every two weeks and blah, blah, blah. So that was a big, big thing for us, right? Also during that time, 
due to COVID, we had a budget crisis here within the city. So uh, we had equipment and staffing cuts. So everything was just hindered and hampered by that. But we started looking at the cost of the equipment, okay? The IV tubing was nominal. We have that stuff all the time. The TXA and the calcium, we thought we were gonna do that route first instead of the blood because, okay, blood's hard to get, blood's in, in short supply. We can get the TXA readily available. Calcium, we had that also. Then it became, okay, if we're gonna do the blood, we have to have a refrigerator to store it, right? On site, it has to be, it can't just be one you get at the Home Depot. We wanted a regulated, and, that, and a lot of that was based on what the specifications of the blood center was, okay? <clears throat> they, there's a certain parameter that they wanted it to be, and it has to be X amount of cold, it has to be monitored, it has to be all this other stuff. So we knew we needed a high dollar refrigerator. So of course, we don't have the money for that. Well, our friends over at the New Orleans Health Department, Dr. Vegno, she was uh, kind enough to find some grant funds or she had some laying around and she says, sure, I'll get y'all a fridge. All right, cool. Well, the coolers that we they carry the blood in on the, the uh, uh, units and sprint cars, the blood center stepped up and said like, hey, how many of those you need? You know, we'll, we'll, put, we'll do it, but we'll put our name on them. Is that cool? It's like, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll advertise for it because y'all are our blood supplier. So they bought us three of those little coolers. We looked at the warmers. We looked at the, uh, I believe it's the Pro Warrior is what it was, the one that everybody recommended and used because of the flow and, and the ease and the compatibility with everything. Uh, and it was stupid expensive. I mean, it's like, it was close to the refrigerator cost, but we would need at least two of those preferably three if we were going to have backup upon backup. And that that's that was our stumbling block was right there. Was the warmer, the blood, we figured out uh, working with the blood center that uh, low titer um, PRBCs, or excuse me, low titer whole blood was not going to be very plausible to get because it was very short supply and the trauma center had first dib rights to that. And that's where we wanted it to be there. So we went with the LRBCs and uh, then just out of a fluke, somebody somewhere saw the life flow, right? These guys come in with this thing and we're going like, man, this is like voodoo stuff. It's like, you know, what is this thing? It's because it's like, they said it can flow X amount of does. Like, sure it can. So they came out and they did a demo for us. And it's like, we all go like, there might be something here. So it, it was like, right as we were getting ready to go, you know, with our training and stuff, they came in right there at the last second. and we go like, oh, we'll give it a shot. We we bought a couple of them, right? And um, take a little med control moment because Tom um, explained it so well. And yet there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes that medical directors and their colleagues um, decide upon that no one really understands why. And so we were asked a lot of questions about the blood program by not only our medics, um, but pretty much everyone around the city, the, the um, receiving emergency physicians, any of the trauma doctors that might not have been up to speed. Um, and certainly we know that you might have some questions too. And so one of the big questions we got asked was why didn't you use whole blood? And Tom explained it ex exactly as it was. We would have loved to use whole blood. Um, physiolog physiologically, I would argue that it probably is the best option. But the truth is the best often costs more. And so we just couldn't do it. Um, we could not afford it. And as he already stated, it was something that we couldn't rotate back out with a distributor. So we wanted to be sure that we weren't wasting any blood products for us or for the city in general. And additionally, we did not want to take away from the trauma center or any other hospital that might need any of those blood components. The next question we frequently had was, why did we use red blood cells instead of plasma? And so this answer is not quite so straightforward. You know, TCCC guidelines and a lot of larger civilian studies um, like PAMPER, they've suggested either plasma or red blood cells if you're not using whole blood. And so we chose red blood cells because we wanted to prioritize oxygen delivery during the cells, given the short transport times that we had in our urban environment. We also felt that um, historically red blood cells probably hadn't been used in a lot of studies because they're a packing challenge. It's difficult to keep them cold in a ground setting. Um, and there have been studies that have shown moderate success with air ambulance, but we felt that this was something that we could overcome 
um, with our small environment where we can get blood to us and to our patients quickly. So we decided to give this a try. And then another question we get is why do we only do trauma patients? And so this was really because we recognized that this was a trial. There is not yet a lot of literature to support its benefit. And so we wanted to start with a population that we could closely track their outcomes. And so we have only one uh, ACS verified trauma center where we can work intimately with it to gather the data and hopefully expand as we prove its benefit. Then the logistical questions about our equipment choices really um, do highlight a lot of the research that was done behind the team behind the scenes by our QA and our logistics team. They did a lot of research on the warmers. Um, and we would have loved warmers, but honestly, we just couldn't afford that either, as was stated. And in hindsight, I don't know if we would have had time given our short transports, but that's uh, neither here nor there, and we're finding success without it. We had looked at several studies indicating that multiple agencies within Europe actually don't warm their blood prior to transfusing it. So we did have precedence in this matter. And when we looked at the literature from transfusion medicine journals, it suggested that patients lose about one to two degrees Fahrenheit of core temperature with two units of blood. And so we felt that that was a risk that we were comfortable taking. We discussed it with the trauma team over at UMC and they said, get the patients here. If you get them here alive, we will fix their hypothermia when they arrive. And then why the life flow infuser? Well, we here at New Orleans EMS really think it's awesome. Um, that's a great way to put it. You know, we have, um, medical directors here with a background in both adult and pediatric emergency medicine. And so we have used a lot of infusers within our careers of different shapes and sizes. The life flow was faster than the pressure bags and the pressure, pressure cuffs, a lot smaller than the other infusers that you see rolled into the ambulance bay at the hospital. And it was just super user friendly. It was so easily loaded. And we found very quickly that once you have it loaded, our providers could actually infuse it with just one hand. And so we had to make a lot of decisions early on that we were right for us. And we recognize that there's more than one way to do things. Um, and so certainly as you consider this for your crew, I just encourage you to think about what might be the best thing for you. But this has really worked out well for us. I'm gonna hand it back over to you, Tom. All right, so pre-launch in July of 2021, we made our final purchasing decision. So we decided what we were gonna do. We wrote our operational policies, we drafted them up uh, and it was heavily on the logistics side and the equipment side and like the processes of everything, right? Uh, the clinical guidelines uh, was a document that basically encompassed everything as far as like the criteria of, of for the blood and then uh, like the whole process from receiving it from the blood bank and also checking it in, checking it out every day in the, in the temperature checking and, the, and what to do if something gets out of whack. So that was a long drawn out process for us because we kept, we didn't know what we didn't know. So we just kept drafting things and then we'd try it on the back end and to see what would work. Uh, and then we did the blood medic selection and that was a very hard thing for us to do because we have exceptional, like Dr. Nichols mentioned earlier, exceptional pre-hospital clinicians here. And everybody wants to be a part of, of something new and they also want to, you know, want to be on the cutting edge of stuff. But we had to make some hard decisions on, on who was going to get it because not every medic is in a sprint position or is capable of sprinting. So we had to pick and choose and it, it ruffled some feathers. And I'll be honest about that. But in the long run, it's we have we told them and they understood it's like this is a trial. This is not absolute. We're still changing things as we're going. Once we get it to a point where we're ready to go, we'll add some more, y'all. So then we developed our training. And it's like, that was kind of my, my area of expertise on that is because I worked with the education department. And, uh, you know, it, it sounds corny, but I used a lot of YouTube videos. I reached out to YouTube because that's had everything already done that we wanted. And there's some excellent articles in, uh, that I got and found online and that basically demonstrate the amount of blood loss that we have. And, and it's like to estimate like a visual blood loss, how much is on the ground, how much is on concrete, how much is on when it's on dirt or sand or whatever else. That became invaluable for our, our medics, they said after the fact, because they gave them an idea because I wanted them to be able to document that in their, in their PCR so we could 
could basically paint a good picture looking, looking back at it and researching this, estimating blood loss. But we had to do multiple things, you know, so it was like basically I split it up and like I said, okay, look, y'all do your training. Uh, I'm going to send you all these links. I want you to do it, do your webinars, read these articles, and then I want you to come in for a class. So it, I think it roughly, um, you know, uh, we had to do a, a class that he came in for an hour or two. I believe it was a two-hour class. We ended up doing it. But it was just to check off the equipment and go through the process, okay? Then what happened? Hurricane Ida. We were set, ready to go. We had our training scheduled. We'd actually done one training day in August. And um, we were scheduled for one the next week. And that was the week the hurricane came. And it's like, we go like, oh, well, we'll just put it off. You know, we'll delay. And um, actually, we had the guys from LifeFlow coming in. And they kept going like, should we book our flight or not? It's like, I wouldn't book it. You know, it's New Orleans. We, we might get it direct hit or we might miss us, you know, by a hundred miles. Well, our luck ran out and it's like, we got the direct hit. So um, basically we had a, a major, well, I think they classified it recently as a cat four, uh, you know, hit over the area. And, and it's like, we had uh, just went into chaos like we always do. And, uh, but we dealt with it. So we, um, we uh, ended up going and uh, just taking care of our hurricane stuff. And then we decided, Okay, a month or two by, and I think we uh, we finally finished up our training on, um, it was in, uh, I believe it's in October is when we did it, and then we went live, okay? So, uh, yeah, here's here's uh, the slide here with what we did. We had literature and re uh, articles for you. We used YouTube videos. We did a QAQI, a Zoom webinar. I did this with Dr. Duchesne, and basically what I asked the, all of our medics, I said, Tell me what questions you have. And they had everything. It's like, what about the, uh, you know, the, the triad of death? You know, it's like, you got to keep your patients warm and you got to do this. And Dr. Duchesne, he was candid. He was honest. And he, he told fact. And he told him, he said, like, just like we said about keeping them warm, we can deal with one or two degrees. You know, it's like they'll take care of that on the back end. So it, it built some confidence and it allowed our medics to have the their say basically. And it's like, um, you know, that's, I've been a paramedic for a long time, uh, 30 some odd years. And it's like, that's the most thing I've ever wanted to be heard, right? It's like, here, here are my concerns and what question do I have? You know, it's like, answer my question. And, you know, so we did that. And then we brought LifeFlow in, like I said, um, they came in and they, uh, their staff uh, was able to answer every question. And we just let them do their thing, you know, teach our people. Because we're not 100% familiar with it. We weren't at the time. And we've learned a lot of things using it. And it's like every time we have what we think is an issue, it's like, oh, it's not an issue. The medics think they're fine. And like I said, the biggest thing was documentation of the blood administration. It's like we wanted a good, good feedback, good documentation. We wanted good, um, basically, because we want to go back and look at this stuff. So one of the big things that we, uh, we, and still on our people is to get a temperature, obtain a baseline temperature, and then if possible, get a second one. But we're using the trauma center basically as our second temperature. But that's going to show us two things. It's going to show us a reaction if they have one, if they start to have a reaction to the blood transfusion. And it's also going to, we're going to demonstrate and see if there was a temperature difference or variance. So uh, that was just kind of one of the, the, the Lanyap things we wanted to get on the back end that nobody ever thought of until um we started doing it so that's a, that was one of our lessons like i said it was about eight hours worth of training so we did in october 18th is when we went live after two years many disasters later we we rolled out with 29 blood medics uh carrying blood it was it's not every day that has blood or every shift but i'd say now it's up to the majority of every day some days they have two uh blood medics out there every day uh staggering shifts day and night um, but they carry two units of uh, LRBCs carried on a sprint. Uh, they also have PXA and they also have um, calcium and you'll see them and coming up what well, we carry it in, right? We keep an additional, at least an additional two units here. Usually they keep four because we've been rapidly using it uh, certain days. You know, we'll go on these spurts. Sometimes they'll use it four times in 24 hours and other times it'll go a week and we won't use any blood. But like I said earlier, from the blood center, they're able to give us blood 24-7 uh, within four hours. 
and uh, you'll see there on the screen, that's our, just our, just our traumatic shock protocol from our, um, our guidelines there, right? And as you see the, uh, the blood protocol there off to the uh, left. Uh, but, you know, it tells uh, we had we put the caveat in there for whole blood or PRBCs and, or fresh frozen plasma as well. And then if you see down there at the bottom, you can kind of see the uh, the uh, transfusion criteria. So um, we have it also built in that uh, they can contact medical control or they can contact um, the medical directors offline if need be uh, to. Uh, consult, but we haven't had any problems with that. The medics are very uh, up to speed and they know what to do and they just make it happen. Okay, what you see here is just basically our equipment. The black bag at the top is uh, just kind of our overall, what we carry the blood bag. We have two blood bags. We have, because they were like um, demo bags that we had just lying around. Like I said, we were trying to keep it on a low cost. So we have a blue one and a black one. Uh, and then over there, uh, you'll see if we go kind of clockwise, you'll see the uh, the first refrigerator you see with the um, the gauge temperature wheel on top. That's the blood fridge, and that's what it is. And it maintains the temperature. It has an alarm on it, um, so it's there, and that's where the blood is. And the one next to it is the freezer, which we keep the cells for the little um, what do they call it? The little cooler, the thermal isolation chamber, I believe, is what its technical name is. Um, but anyways, the, the Credo one is the one we're using, um, seemed to be the best and funny story with that. When we got that first one, we were scared. Our logistics guy, Chief Palmazano was skeptical of it. So he, we, we talked to the blood center. They gave us a, basically an expired bag of blood and he put it in his car in the heat of the summer here in New Orleans and left it with a temperature probe on it. And uh, just to see what it would do. And it's like we never got out of temp after 24 hours. He was leaving it out. So um, we knew we had that built-in safety factor. You can kind of see what we keep in the, in the bag. Uh, uh, we, we started carrying a junctional tourniquet in there. Well, the blue bag in the middle uh, is like just IV stuff, IO stuff if you need extra stuff. Um, and then, uh, of course, the Credo bag fits inside of there. You also have your TXA and your calcium. And we have a temp gun in there. I don't know if you can see it in the... The picture kind of in the middle, uh, but we have just a, a I guess it's a laser type temp gun to uh, be able to as to check the blood temperature at, at a glance, and it's also uh, we're using it on the patients as just as a secondary means. We also try to get an axillary and oral if we can, but we're trying to see if that's uh, you know how much they pan out. But then uh, of course off to the um, in the plastic bags, you'll see then the one to the left of that picture is the. Those are the containers, they're the bags of the life flows, what they come in. They come preset with the, and then there's a picture of the life flow there if you're not familiar with it. Uh, but uh, it comes with the tubing already set up and it's uh, uh, just a blood wide tubing, but it's proprietary. I think that's just about everything we got there. If you could see the little, uh, the one on top of the Credo bag, that's the uh, thermometer that goes inside and we wedge that in between the, the two bags of blood that they carry in there. So it maintains the temperature and it alarms if it gets out of that uh, temperature parameter. All right, so I'm gonna pass it back over to Dr. Nichols and she's gonna kind of wrap it all up. Thanks, Tom. So here we are six months later and we are just really excited to share with you what we have found thus far. So as of this session, we have actually given pre-hospital blood to over 40 patients since last fall. We're right on target with our anticipated use numbers that, for the year. And so as of May 4th, we had given blood to 39 patients in New Orleans. And so 36 of these persons were male and the two of the three females were of childbearing age. And so our goal is always to give our LUCA reduced blood O negative. There are periods where we actually had to give O positive when O negative was not available. This is however in line though with the recommendations from plenty of literature that just says save the patient's life. We can test RH incompatibility later on our childbearing mothers once that woman survives. And so our goal is always O negative, but sometimes we actually have needed positive as well. The average age of our patients has been 35.6 years. Now 92% of our population, 36 out of 39 of our patients have sustained penetrating trauma. The majority of these have been gunshot wounds. We haven't yet coordinated with the trauma center to get the official injury severity scores, 
But what we're finding is that the ISS may not actually give the full story. We're really having to look at each injury uniquely and understand the type and the physiology and the pathophysiology of every particular wound. So here's a greater breakdown of the products that we transfused. Our medics actually have taken to giving the two units of blood very quickly up front, and then they're using the life flow to also give the calcium. They're flushing the line very quickly, clearing out all of the blood, and then following the calcium right after that. So the orange portion of the pie here, that 16, has been our patients that have received blood and calcium. Now, if time permits, they're then following that up with the TXA. A cohort that we're actually hoping to increase is the number of junctional tourniquets that we're actually applying in the field. And that's something that we later recognize as an area that we needed to improve upon locally. But the biggest thing that I'm proud of about this is that we have not wasted any blood products to date. None of them have expired. And this is really due to that work by our logistics team that uh, Captain Dransfield just talked about to make sure that our protocols were conservative and that our blood was kept cold and monitored throughout the blood medic shift. Now here's our preliminary outcomes. This graph shows the average vital signs of our patients both pre and post an average of two units of red blood cells transfused to them en route to the hospital. Their heart rates dropped 15 beats per minute and their systolic blood pressures and their maps also improved. We actually had shock indices over two and a half on some of our patients and all of these improved after the blood transfusion. When taking a conservative statistical approach, we still found a reduction in the shock index of our patients on average by 30%. You'll notice on the right that we accomplished a lot of this with just one large bore IV. Many of the patients um, did not have time to get a second line because our medics were actually just too busy resuscitating them. And here's the times that you see. When we calculated them from our EPCRs, we actually found an average total time from 911 to the hospital was just 33 minutes. Of course, we can never know the time of injury when we calculate the golden hour, but the PSAP call to 911 is the closest we can get. And you can see our providers, they're not staying and playing, but guess what? They're not loading and going either. We've chosen option C, don't wait, resuscitate. And so with our providers resuscitating during transport, you can see our mortality outcomes thus far. So as of May 4th, of the patients that have received blood, 69% of them have lived beyond seven days. Now our hospital mortality data is a little bit delayed, but based on the first 23 patients where we've gathered all of their outcomes through the end of March, 20 out of the 23 patients were actually discharged and 18 of them were discharged to their homes. Now out of those first 39, 11 of the 12 did expire and they actually did so within the first 30 minutes on arrival to the hospital. So they never actually left the ED. But when we looked back at our data, we found that 10 out of those 11 actually had arrested either on scene or en route to the hospital. We also noticed when looking at our data that the amount of blood required in the hospital was drastically reduced for those that had received transfusions in the pre-hospital setting. All of these numbers look like they're reinforcing the fact that the first 60 minutes is no longer determined solely by your location, but instead by how we identify your injuries and the chance of survival and how we immediately address them and resuscitate. And so here's the difference that we're proposing based on our small trial versus the other trials that have been out in the literature to date. Many of the studies in the past have focused on penetrating trauma only in the military setting. A lot of civilian studies have looked mostly at blunt trauma, so car collisions and falls. That's different from ours. As you saw, the majority of our patients really do have pathophysiology probably more similar to the military setting. Here at New Orleans EMS, our study also varies in the type and volume of blood products. We've chosen red blood cells, which really have not been studied very much in an urban setting. And then we also have very different transport times. We're not an air service, we're a ground service, but we're quick. And we're getting volume to the patients very quickly. 
As you can see on the right, our providers, even without gloves on their hands, which um, is another side comment, they are getting the blood in quickly with their life flow infusions. So even though we have a small sample size, we're excited to see the results. They're outstanding and they're growing. And so when we talk about pre-hospital blood, a lot of times we're really only referencing about three, four, or five studies. And these are the big ones that people always talk about in all of their acronyms. We have COMBAT, PROPER, PAMPER, REFILL. It's hard to remember which is which. But PROPER is really the study that got a lot of um, attention back in 2015 and really started uh, the EMS community thinking about how we could get blood products into the field. And then that came just three years later with Pamper and Combat, which actually had conflicting results. But when you think about it, all of this has happened just within the last seven plus years. That's a very short period of time. In the last four years, there have been numerous trials on looking at pre-hospital transfusions, including this last one in Lancet, Lancet and Refill that actually um, argues against pre-hospital blood. But here's the thing, you cannot compare apples to oranges. And here at New Orleans EMS, we're doing something that's unique from many other studies. And we really believe that the difference is in our timing. I'm gonna pass it to Dr. Peel to break this down a little bit further. Thanks so much, Emily. And it's a total privilege to be working with you guys on this study and just to uh, see what amazing accomplishments you've had despite a lot of challenges over the past couple of years. So thanks for inviting me to participate. And I've begun to study this myself and, and try to figure out why is it that your mortality and your outcomes seem to be uh, so much better than some of the previous studies. And, and I'll acknowledge uh, my bias in being one of the creators of the life flow. So just everyone listening has to take that uh, into consideration. Um, but I do believe that the talent of your team, the the transport times that you have and the amount of work you're able to get done within the short transport teams really are transport times really are responsible for uh, the incredible mortality differences that you're seeing compared to some of these studies. So I thought we'd just glance at these real quick. Um, folks on the call may be aware that the long awaited UK trial called refill just came out and they looked at pre hospital blood products versus saline in their trauma patients and the conclusion the headline of the story was it doesn't work. It's no better than saline. And I think a lot of folks risk looking at the headline of a study and thinking that's the definitive answer. And so what we've done here is break down um, through each of the studies uh, that Emily mentioned, and I added one other in there, one military study, the, the individual time components of each of these. And one thing that also is worth pointing out is in all the various studies, there are many apples and oranges to compare. The, the type of patients, the type of injury, the type of blood, blood product, the type of transport, air versus ground, are all vastly different, so it's difficult to compare them. So what we tried to do is just look here at um, the individual components, and if you'll go to uh, refill at the top, that's the British study, we don't know exactly what the time between injury and response was, but it was somewhere between 15 and 30 minutes, um, up to 45 minutes. And then uh, these providers, uh, we're not exactly sure why, spent about another 25 minutes on the scene and then administered their two units of uh, blood products within, a, and again, a long 35-minute transport time. And they showed no difference with blood products, which kind of makes some sense. Those patients who were critically ill had a long, long time to shock reversal and took a long time to get to the hospital and presumably weren't um, as physiologically improved by it. And you can see there that their mortality rate was about 42%, and they did not include traumatic arrests in those numbers. And just leave that for you as a placeholder. Pamper and Combat, the two trials done in Texas and Denver of pre-hospital blood and or plasma, um, interestingly, they had a little bit of a shorter uh, window of transport, but still a 40-minute transport time in which they were able to administer about two units of products. Um, and uh, the studies combined showed a slight mortality benefit, uh, but not uh, huge. Uh, the big medevac, air medical evacuation study in the military, similarly pretty long pre-hospital time, and then a, a one unit of plasma or pack cells given within a 20-minute transport time, they did show some improvement in mortality. And again, notice that on the, in the columns on the right, the penetrating versus blunt trauma in all these 
is vastly different. So when we get down to New Orleans, we'll see that you guys have a, the, the highest rate of penetrating trauma of any study. A large study out of San Antonio, the trendsetters really in uh, pre-hospital blood administration, the folks that really paved the way for everyone else, uh, similar, similarly showed in their recent series of about 500 patients that there was an early mortality difference, but they have not yet been able to show a mot- mortality improvement um, to hospital discharge. And they're able to give about one unit of whole blood within their 30-minute transport time with about a 30% mortality. So now to New Orleans. Again, as I really mentioned, uh, a fairly a small N of now about 40 patients. But you guys are quick. And the way you've staged your your trucks and your blood and your medics around the city and are able to get to them quickly, package quickly, and get to the hospital within 10 minutes is absolutely remarkable. A very sick patient population, penetrating trauma of 95%. The pre-administration systolic blood pressure in the 60 or 70 range, and you're able to give two units of blood in the in the ambulance, restore their blood pressure, reverse the shock. In many cases, mental status and blood pressure have returned to almost normal by the time they get to the ED, and it's resulting, I believe, in vastly improved mortality. You see the 33% figure there, but um, you included the traumatic arrests in that. If you re- if you exclude that number, it's near 100% for. Vo- survival among your patients. So I do believe, Emily, as you mentioned, that speed of shock reversal makes the difference. And your choice of pack cells to add oxygen carrying capacity and not warmed pack cells, it's kind of heresy. If you think about the the current thinking in um, pre-hospital trauma resuscitation, but it appears to be working because you're fixing their major problem, which is shock, and you're giving them oxygen carrying capacity and you're doing it quickly. So um, congrats to you, all, and I can't wait to see more of the data as they become available. Well, thank you, Dr. Peel. Um, I just want to, like, they were talking, Dr. Nichols and Dr. Peel were talking about some of our outcomes and what we've had. Uh, I just wanted to just go over two quick cases here. Uh, this is one that uh, was a multiple gunshot wound in one of our uh, administrations. He had uh, uh, to both his legs with arterial bleeding, so they, uh, they basically ended up, I think this one got bilateral tourniquets, but Started out with initial vital signs of a 60 palpation, heart rate of 130, uh, respiratory rate was 20, GCS was 10, so he was very lethargic. Uh, you know, just he was, he's going down fast, right? And so uh, what I did is I asked, asked the medic, it was Joe, Joe Frazier. Uh, I said, give me a recap on this one, and he's like, you know, and what it's like to to see the the difference. And he says, uh, you know, it was just amazing to see it. Uh, he said. And he wrote this in his report too. But the guy went from a GCS of 10 to a GCS of 14. And the guy's complaining about the tourniquet on his leg now. Okay. And it's like, and I've had several medics tell me that that they, they've had that problem, or it's a it's a bad problem to have, I guess. You know, it's like your your almost dying patient is now complaining, saying, like, I'm not comfortable, uh, you know, whatever. And it's like they say it's just like night and day. It's given like D50. It's a D50 wake up or the Narcan, you know, post Narcan administration is what they say. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, so uh, next one I want to talk about is one that uh, that uh, Shaq had uh, and uh, Shaquille Harris. He's one of our other blood medics. So this one was like he gets there. This guy's multiple GSW. Now, Shaq's he's a night guy. He works nights. I used to work nights when I was a, a, an eye walker. Uh, so I have a place in my heart for the night shift guys, but Shaq, you know, we all have to do it sometimes work overtime and go to the day shift. So he was working day shift and, uh, just happened to be in the right place at the right time. So he gets dispatched to multiple people shot. Uh, this guy's multiple GSWs to his chest, abdomen, groin, and thigh. Okay. Another 60 pal. This guy's heart rate was 142. Respiratory rate was up there. 42. TCS is 13. So uh, Shaq gets there, gets him going, gets him set up, gets some blood on board to him. Uh, within, I believe it was like six or eight minutes. It wasn't very long because his transport time is pretty quick. They're out of Central City. Uh, the the post blood pressure he got was 138 over 88. Right, heart rate had dropped 20 points to 126. Respiratory rate dropped 20 to 24. He's a GCS of 15. But when Shaq first got to that guy. That's what the guy said. He says, I'm going to die. And anybody that's been doing this business anytime knows when a patient tells you they're going to die, you better believe them, right? <laughs> and it's like, so uh, it's one of those that Shaq's probably, he's one of our heavy hitters because he does work nights. So he does 
has done a bunch of blood administrations just by luck of the draw uh, that that his uh, time on the sprint car has been that way. But, um, you know, it's like, it's just one of those things that he's the one of the ones that tells me, like, it's like amazing to see the difference that the blood makes to him. Uh, but I just want to share those those quick stories. And and I don't think we touched on it earlier, but our concept that we do for blood, we do a two medic concept. OK, we have a blood medic that is solely responsible for the blood administration. And then the other paramedic that's on board is either with a transport unit or whatever. And they're responsible for all the other aspects of patient care. So it allows that blood medic to focus solely on getting that blood on board and getting that. It allows him to, to manage his time. Uh, he's not worried about an airway or anything like that. The other medic is there to, to take care of that stuff, get the second IV access, do whatever needs to be done and assist because a lot of them are the blood medics also that are working the truck. So um, we've, we've had fortunate times where we had three or four blood medics on scene of a call. And it's like, so they're all just jump in and do what needs to be done. And those, those guys really have good scene times on those because they're just getting everything firing on all cylinders. So throughout the last six months, you know, there's some little tricks and um, things that we have just learned the hard way. And one of those was um, making sure that you really practice and you repractice your life flow. And so for all the times that we did it in training, there were a lot of moments where after a critical call, all of the medics, the blood medics that weren't the ones using the life flow would come back into the QA office and say, hey, can we review this again? And so it's really important that everyone knows the ways to troubleshoot because we did have one incident, not, not the one in the picture, but we did have one where we had a little challenge working with it. And we went back to the uh, 410 team and they troubleshooted it with us. And it was um, a little bit of a user error, but that's been one out of 40 plus cases. And so it's just something you need to practice. Um, we did have another incident where um, the, you know, the provider wasn't able to have the life flow and they tried it without it and it did not go well. Um, and so that was a prime example of the difference. Um, that blood went in very slowly for that patient. We also learned during this that we had to make sure that we were continuing our QA and ensuring that our providers were doing all of the processes to control reversible hemorrhage that we have always talked about with our hot seat. And so we had to remind them that they needed to march on track, make sure that they are decompressing any tension pneumothoraces or um, getting tourniquets on, just making sure that they're following the process and not just jumping straight to the blood because it's exciting. And as stated before, we just wanna be sure we're using the full array of tools in our team so that we can really get the patients the best care. And then also um, just lessons is that we can't bill for this at this point. And so we are really trying to produce some evidence um, and bring back some outcomes that will help us to gain some funds and potentially keep doing this and expanding the program. Now, as we look to the future, we are currently um, training our next group of blood medics. Our goal is to have um, all of our qualified medics out in the field um, giving blood when they have um, a shift while they're on the sprint SUVs. And so that requires a lot of monitoring, a lot of QA and looking at outcomes and making sure that our processes are good. And so as we compile the data, we also wanna make sure that we are contributing to the medical literature. We think that we have something really unique um, that we want to share. And hopefully um, this will move from just being enthusiasm-based medicine, which I, I heard, I saw a critique in an article to actual evidence-based medicine, because we do believe that we're bringing some data that really could have great outcomes in the proper patient setting. In the future, we will consider whether or not PRBCs are better than plasma. There's still not a lot out there on that topic, but we hope to be able to prove something with it. And I know that there are some trials out there right now that are looking directly at uh, one versus the other. And if we can afford a warmer, um, we might consider using that one. And then certainly we have talked from day one about whether or not we want to expand to GI bleeds or postpartum hemorrhage, things that are medical hemorrhagic shock. And that remains to be determined. Um, a lot of this does matter, um, depend on funding. And so we're hoping that we'll get that down the road. But in the meantime, we're going to just continue resuscitating because that's what we do as an industry best. Um, and I just want to give a little shout out to Captain Dransfield in that photo right there on scene. Hey, Emily, that's exciting. And I want to just add one more um, thought, which is the controversy about giving anything cold. And it's right, especially in the trauma bay, we don't want to make patients cold. But uh, it's probably true that 
hypothermia has occurred because of large volume resuscitation with blood products in the hospital, in the OR, in the trauma bay, less so likely because of the couple of units um, the pre-hospital professionals may give. And I think uh, in some of the data that Tom has been tracking, temperature in his patients have actually gone up in some cases uh, despite giving cold products. And that seems counterintuitive, but it may just be that they're better perfused and their skin temp looks better once they have some volume in them. So it's fascinating to see that you actually probably have not made your patients colder with those two units. Not that it, it's, it's uh, not, not that it's wrong to think about eventually adding warmer. It probably is a good idea when that day comes, but you're, you're breaking some new ground here in that you're giving pack cells that are cold and the patients are still doing better. So I think we're learning something about the science of pre-hospital resuscitation from your work. And I would also point out that uh, in the combat study, they tried to use fresh frozen plasma and, and thaw it and warm it on the scene. And that probably resulted in a long time to delivery. And it's just not a, not as suitable a solution. So the pack cells for you guys without access to whole blood was a really great choice. That's a great point. Thanks so much, Mark. And so we're going to wrap it up right here, but we hope to bring some take home tips to you. Our goal is that by looking at our, our approach, you can really identify opportunities for you. There's so many, um, there's such a dearth of literature that really is giving us great information on the pre-hospital civilian setting. And so we encourage you to really review the literature, look at your patient population, the types of injuries, your transport times, and the resources you have, and really consider getting pre-hospital blood products out into the field. If you're going to go down this route, it's important that you're collaborating early with trauma as well as transfusion medicine, whether that's a blood center in the hospital or a private vendor within your community. You really need to have those advocates to help you maintain momentum, but you do have to be patient. It took us two plus years. And so we're excited to be at this point. And then lastly, option C, don't wait, resuscitate. You need to have that manpower. So you do have to keep that in mind. We do shift patients, excuse me, we do shift medics to our most critical patients, but we believe that that is really saving lives and we're seeing people walk home and it's been such a great experience. And we're just excited um, to grow our program and we hope you do the same, same and that you share your results. I close with this last slide, which just um, came out, this study came out not too long ago, showing our data from 2019 as an industry of over 300 million pre-hospital trauma patients, 313 received pre-hospital blood products. There's a lot more that we can do, hold truths, but half the blood. We really have to get that information out there and tell our story and learn from each other. So we hope you've done that today. Thanks so much. Thank you, Emily, Tom, and Mark for the incredibly powerful story. I know our audience is inspired and motivated by your message and they wanna ask you some questions. So we'll now move into the audience Q&A. If you have a question for the presenters, please type it into the chat and we will do our best to get it answered.